Hello, Matt here. Just before we get into this first episode of Season 3, a little content note. In the first book we discuss Sumi's first day of school ever. The main character, Sumi, experiences racism from one of her classmates, and we discuss it as part of the story. It's at a level we think is appropriate for even very young children, but if you're not up for that today, no problem. You can skip ahead to our discussion of the second book, The Last Last Day of Summer by Lamar Giles, which will start at 12 minutes. And with that, on with the show. Hello and welcome to Even the Trunchbull, our show about children's books and why we still love them as adults. She's Nina. They're Matt. And we think that children's books are for everyone because we've all been kids. Even, Even the, the Trunchbull. Trunchbull. They're all mistakes, children. Trusty nasty things. Glad I never was one. From Ruel Dahl's beloved Matilda, despite her protestations. Each episode, we'll be reviewing one picture book and one chapter book. We're starting off with the books that we read as kids, but if you've got a book you'd like us to review, especially if you are currently a kid, please get in touch. You can email us on eventhetrunchbull at gmail.com or catch us on Twitter at trunchbullpod. And for our Series 3 debut in this, the first week of September, we're reading around Back to School. We know that this is going to be a particularly weird one this year for kids going back to school um, in person for the first time in months. Uh, for some kids starting distance learning over the computer or homeschooling for the first time. And the books we've picked don't directly speak to those experiences, but we think they still invoke the right kind of mood. Our picture book is The Lovely Sumi's First Day of School Ever by So Young Pak and illustrated by Young and Kim, which is about someone going to school in a strange country for the first time. And our chapter book, The Last Last Day of Summer by Lamar Giles, plays with the possibility of summer never ending and school never coming back. And if that doesn't bring up quarantine feelings, then what does? Yes, if, you, if it feels like uh, someone has hit a pause button on time, uh, during the last few months, then, yeah, this book will definitely ring true to that. Yeah. <laughs> but first off, I think we're going to start with Sumi's first day of school ever. Yes. Aren't we? So do you want to do you want to take us through what's happening there, Nina? Yeah. So I really like this one. Um, it's about Sumi, a little Asian girl, I would assume Korean who's going to school, I think, in the US for the first time, or definitely like a white English-speaking country. Mm. And she's practicing with her mum in the morning. Her mum teaches her how to respond to what is your name with my name is Sumi. And so they practice that, what is your name? My name is Sumi, all through getting dressed and walking to school. And Mm. then Sumi's mum leaves her at school and it's terrifying Everything is strange, can't understand what people are saying. One boy, like, squishes up his eyes, you know, in a racist way at her. And the teacher yeah. catches him and makes him yeah. apologise. But still, that happens, and, you know, she doesn't understand what the, what's happening in the lesson. But she gets to do a drawing, and the drawing is approved of and hung up on the wall by the teacher, and so she feels cared for by the teacher. And then at break mm. time... She finds a stick and goes and does some drawing in the dirt. So clearly drawing is important to Sumi. And another little girl yeah. comes and sits down next to her and does some drawing in the dirt next to her with a different stick. And then yeah. they tell each other their names. She goes, hello, my name is Mary. What is your name? And Sumi's like, ah, this is the phrase I know. My name is Sumi. <laughs> and they go back into the class together. And there's a lovely picture. And they're holding there. hands, yeah. which is really lovely. Yeah, it's really cute. It's really nice. It's like a really hopeful yeah. ending, and Sumi says to herself, maybe it's not so scary and not so lonely after all at school. And then the last picture we have with just the end as text is kind of Sumi back at home in her mum's lap. Yeah, telling it, her all it about just it. just clearly such an animated picture sort of in the middle of telling her all about her day. It reminded me a bit um, of Bigu telling her parents all about Earth. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Um, for anyone who's uh, joining us for the first time, you listen back to, oh, I think probably about episode four, yeah. something like that, um, when we talked about Bigu, which is a, quite a similar story to this, but with an alien rabbit 
Um, yeah, no, it is a really similar vibe, actually. Mm. And that same kind of coziness and loneliness holding hands. Yeah. I think um, the illustrations actually pick up on that sort of kids drawing thing. I wouldn't say they're childlike drawings. They're very good drawings. They're sort of like watercolour pencil or something. But they sort of have this naive quality about them as well. Especially when you look at the perspective. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, they're, they're, they're simple. They're just, I mean, I guess in the same way that the the story is written, it's just kind of, it. yeah, it tells the story yeah, very simply. Yeah. It just sort of, like, I mean, like I was saying with that final picture, it's like you can, I think it really captures that excitement and all the way through it, like, captures that yeah, sort of trepidation. Yeah. Like, it's definitely one where the words and the pictures are sort of definitely. working together really well. And what drew me to this one is, so I was just looking through um all the picture books about first days of school that I could find and the thing is there is loads of books about how your first day of school will be completely fine right <laughs> yeah. and every, everything will go perfectly and you'll definitely make friends and people will definitely be nice to you and they're, yeah. they're fine but to be honest that feels like a bit of a betrayal it's a bit dismissive of children's anxieties and worries mm. because stuff does go wrong at school sometimes and, yeah. you know, oppressive stuff happens at schools. We know this. And it's not always a yeah. great experience. And I think, without being yeah. pessimistic, this book, you know, ends on a lovely note. It deals with the realities of, like, it's really not perfect. And you might not be wrong to be scared. I mean, to the extent where, as you say, you've got, like, a young boy being actively yeah. racist. Yeah. Which is a pretty bold yeah. move in, like, a kid's picture mm -hmm. book. I think specifically what he's doing is stretching his yeah. eyes, isn't he? It's not a verbal, it's like a visual... Yeah, because if he'd said something racist, she might not have known. Yeah, the teacher says something to him, and then the boy says something to Sumi, and she can't understand what he's saying, but she starts to feel better, and it's clear that he's trying to say something nice. This teacher clearly has Sumi's back, yeah. right? So it's like she's got a real champion there, I guess. Yes, and I think that... That's part of what helps it not be such a bleak book. I was also drawn to this because I did this. I started school in a language I didn't speak. Obviously, because I'm a white person, I didn't experience racist stuff from other children, but definitely xenophobic stuff. And definitely, mm. like, it was really hard starting not knowing to speak the language that the other kids spoke. Because you went to school in France. Yeah, so I went to a French school when I was two, and I had, well, like Sumi does, like a few words because mm. I had a um, French neighbour who watched me sometimes. But, you know, my parents right. spoke to me exclusively in English. My grandparents spoke to me exclusively in English. They had this Canadian friend who spoke to me in English. I think mm. I could say Nina doesn't speak French. <laughs> sure. Right. <laughs> um, and I was lucky yeah. because I had a friend who lived in the same block of flats as me who started school at the same time with me. And right. she was French. And she, you know, just went around introducing me to everyone. And, you know, because I was two, I picked it up quickly. Um, mm. But then she left and I lost my ability to talk to the other kids. And I think this was partly an autism thing as well, is that I had really relied on her socially. And also I moved up into a bigger classroom with slightly bigger kids and I had had this really lovely first teacher who like really got me. And then I had this new teacher, I think she was newly qualified and didn't know me. And I went mute after my friend Meryl left and I just started drawing all the time like what Sumi's doing. But I was punished for right. that because I wasn't talking. Uh, the teacher took away my pens and paper. Oh no. I think it does sound like quite a similar yeah. experience. You know, it yeah. Did Sounds like that, that teacher who took your pens away could have done with this book. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, yeah, so I really connected with this book. I really liked it. And I like that it affirms that, like, school isn't this perfect place where everything will be fine. But it is a place where yeah. you can make your way through and make friends. Yeah, it yeah. is big and scary. Good bit, yeah, but that it is scary. Again, like, the teacher, the nice teacher in this book being so important yeah. is that, like, I think it's easy to kind of, especially with little kids like that, take that for granted, like assume that's a given, yeah. like there's going to be a nice teacher there that's going to make things easier. But like, you know, as you've just said, that's not always the case. Having now 
got to the age that a lot of those teachers probably were when having done a bit of teaching myself like I think as an adult you forget how terrifying mm. that is I, I think it's quite a special thing to have that teacher who's aware enough like this teacher in this story and I think she says as well doesn't she that um um I forget how it's worded but there's a bit she where she pats like, her head just like her mother pats her head yeah and there's that direct link yeah. to like a parental role which I think is really mm. lovely but also, as you say, like, just at least having that acknowledgement at all mm. that it isn't a breeze yeah, is really important. I think that's the other thing it does. You know, we're saying, like, it kind of ends on a positive, but it doesn't feel like a, everything's going to be fine. No, now. she just finds it less scary and big and lonely than she did at the beginning. She doesn't say, this is a great place full of my friends. She says, it's not so scary, not so lonely school. So yeah, it's really lovely, really, really nice, um, really sort of truthful, I think, and affirming of a certain set of experiences, not backing mm. away from them. Mm. Mm. Who Who is it for? Who do you recommend it to? First, to the outsider child who's going into a new situation, and then to all the yeah. children who you would want to treat Sumi well. You want to prime for a Sumi in their classroom. Yeah. And I would add to that parents and teachers yeah. as well. Because yeah. I feel like you want to give it, to, I'd want to give it to a primary school teacher and be like, here, be yeah. like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Are we ready to move on? Yes, let's. Okay. So next up we have another back to school book this one a uh, bit of an older age range quite a bit more going on yeah. it's a it's a cracking book this one it's bizarre so it's the last last day of summer by lamar giles and basically we start with otto and sheed two young black boys cousins who have spent all summer adventuring around their hometown of fry earning keys to the town from mayor ahmed's by sort of like doing these adventures and kind of defeating creatures, it's sort of established that the town of Fry and Logan County that it's in has a lot of weird goings on. So that they've um, fought were bears in the forest and um, keeping the laughing locusts at bay um, and earning these keys whilst battling against these twin sisters who were also doing that. So there's a bit of a rivalry going on. And now it's the last day before school is back. So it's the last day of summer and Otto is feeling a bit wistful, a bit eager for one last day of adventure as sort of pulling Sheed out of bed. And so they set off for one last day of summer and then they meet a, a strange man with a strange Polaroid camera who sort of like tricks them, kind of sweet talks them, pressures them slightly into taking a picture of the town from this vantage point, this hill where you can see the whole town. Um, and he tries to take a picture of them too before... Uh, Older guy, a guy sort of in his sort of late twenties, early thirties, falls out of a time portal and <laughs> wrestles this strange man away and says, "Boys, run!" And then it turns out that you know they get back into town and everyone's frozen. Everything is kind of frozen in time, like you know, hanging in midair. It's sort of described as if the air is like jelly. So these boys can kind of move stuff, but it's kind of like, yeah. um, yes, stuff will move and then stick again. And basically this camera that they've taken a picture of the town with has frozen time. It's a time freezing machine and everything it takes a picture of freezes in time. Otto and she'd run home to find their grandma who they live with. Grandma's frozen too. Everyone's frozen. Can they save the day? This is their biggest adventure yet and <laughs> hijinks and adventure ensue yeah so this is a very like action adventure sci-fi book i like that logan county and frytown are sort of immediately established as places where supernatural things happen but also nobody's that perturbed by it yeah it's just logan county is weird um yeah yeah it reminded me a bit of beach city in steven universe if anyone's watched that, this sort of like small town America where everybody knows your name. Except the twist is that, you know, we've got lots of stories about boys adventuring through small town America, but these are two black boys. 
Jason Reynolds for the New York Times wrote, The last, last day of summer reminds me that all children deserve to exist in magical spaces where their imagination and familial bonds will them into heroism. Every child should have the freedom to be one of the legendary Alstons. Yeah, because you were saying, weren't you, that you read that Lamar Giles had taken inspiration for this from the Phantom Tool booth. Yeah. Which is yeah. a sort of classic milestone in this genre of whimsical adventure. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of, um, you know, we, we get on in this book to the appearance of clock watchers who are kind of personifications yeah. <laughs> of different elements of time. So you have like yeah. Game Time who's wearing, I love the description of how Game Time is dressed. Like you have, she's wearing like swimming goggles and an American football jersey with the shoulder pads <laughs> and uh, uh, tennis shorts um, and like hockey boots um, and it has like a whistle in her mouth and she, uh, like ready to go she's like let's go yeah you have bedtime who are, ends up later being on like the baddies side and they're sort of saying like why did you join the baddies and it's this little toddler in like pajamas who's like well he said that i could stay up past bedtime <laughs> he said i could stay up late so it's like i don't like him but you know that's my soul it's a bit sort of like mr men how they've each got this kind of predetermined mm. personality and purpose and that is so phantom tool booth in it like it is yeah um, we should explain the clock watchers are as a result of time stopping they've sort of all been made jobless yes so they're all just hanging around town they're the only ones who can move because they're not humans who've been frozen yeah they're like the agents of time who now no longer have any work to do. Yeah. And they're just milling around a bit lost. There was uh, some very um, subtle but appreciated by me uh, a gender role fritzery as well mm -hmm. at points in the clock watchers. So that it, like you had quitting time who was described as kind of being rough and gruff voiced and wearing a sleeveless flannel shirt <laughs> and uh, and a hard hat and stomping around in boots going, I'm clocking off, she said. I was like, oh, that's good. That's not... <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, so mm. I, but I suppose, yeah, as you know, as you say, like Phantom Tool Booth that that takes inspiration from is very sort of like, it's very white, I suppose, and it? It's kind of classic yeah. literature. It's a little lonely white boy who gets to go off on his adventure. And yeah, I mean, you know, I guess it'd be nice to live in a world where we didn't, I have to comment on the importance of this, but yeah, being able to have like that same kind of story with two young black boys is is great. Well, and for their main like problem not being like I don't know, police brutality. Yes. You know? Yeah, it's a yeah. It's not an issue based book. Yeah, just a story in it's, which it's just really fun. they are black characters having adventures. Lamar Giles is a co-founder of a organisation called We Need More Diverse Books which is sort of specifically set up to champion precisely this, you know. I think as I was reading it, because you, you'd read it ahead of me, um, and you were saying, oh, how are you finding it? I was like, oh, I'm not so sure yet. And I think the point you made is that kind of about a third to half of the way through, it starts to knit together. Yeah, and that's when you really start to tell that, like, what Lamar Giles has done before this is thrillers. Yeah. I mean, you notice that even at the beginning, like, every chapter ends on at least a bit of a cliffhanger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you realise, sort of about halfway through, that he's been throwing all this, like, seemingly random information and stuff happening at you. Yeah. But actually, it's all part of, like, a very cleverly constructed plot. Yeah. And it all pulls together really nicely. And yeah. it's sort of, like, almost... You know, the boys are like detectives and they're getting to the bottom of this mystery and yeah. you know, like how it happened and how to fix it. And it all wraps up like really tightly at the end. It spreads really wide before it narrows, right? Like yes. you just get a lot of like a lot of fun and games, a lot of kind of world building um, that spreads way wider than the story itself. Like there is so much kind of I was reading this going like, I want to read all of the comic book spin offs <laughs> of this <laughs> book right now. They've got all these maneuvers. They've got a, a catalogue of maneuvers. So it'll be like maneuver number 42, run and hide or something or like maneuver number yeah. six, distract <laughs> grandma while I sneak in through the window. And these are from all their previous adventures. And, like, I guess at first I was reading it going, 
ah, we'll maybe get to find out about all these things at some point. No, not at all. Like, throughout the book, you just get like, oh, yeah, like that time when we, like, captured all those tigers or something. Like, so you just get this rich, rich world that's kind of... Mm. And again, I think at first sort of feels like, oh, this might just be their imaginary world, but it's kind of increasingly, like, the tacit acceptance of all of the adults in this story kind of yeah. blurs that loads. It's like, yeah. like it's like, no, no, this this is actually happening, and this is just a town where loads of really weird stuff happens. It's just pure adventure, but also it's got a re a, a couple of real emotional hits in it as well because it becomes about family, yeah, it's, it's about friendships, well. um, like these yeah. two lads who are cousins who are brought up by their grandma. I wanted to talk about um, how their grandma has raised them with regard to consent as well and I found that consent was quite a big theme in this book because like the whole you know like inciting incident is a breach of consent actually is these two black boys on top of a hill and this weird white man comes over and like pressures them so first he's like I want to give you a gift for being you know such pillars of the community and Otto says, no, nah, our grandma always says we shouldn't accept anything for doing good. Mm. He says no, but, like, Mr. Flux, the baddie, really pushes it. And then he says, oh, can I get a picture of you? And it's clear that Sheed doesn't like having his picture taken. Mm. But Otto's like, no, come on, this is no way to treat a fan. We've got to be polite. Like, they were going to go along with mm. it, even though they've said no. They're having their boundaries pushed mm. by this guy. And the only reason the picture of them doesn't get taken is because the time traveller drops on top of Mr. Flux and they roll off together. Yeah. And then there's a later bit which I've written down. So when the boys find Wiki and Lean Ellison, their nemeses, the girls, mm. and they're frozen, and Otto's worked out how to unfreeze humans, which is difficult and more complicated than unfreezing objects, he says to her, Listen, I'm going to unstick you now. I have to touch you to do it. Is it okay if I grab your arm? Yeah. Yeah, and I think, again, doesn't they sort of specifically mention that Grandma's told them that you yeah, must Grandma always ask. Yeah, Grandma that you've got to ask before touching someone. Yeah, like, e- even yeah. if it's necessary. Uh, he doesn't really like Wiki. Like, even if it's someone you don't like, and even if it's necessary, mm. you still get permission first. Yeah. And then there's this other nice bit, like, a little bit later, about, you know, like, maybe getting consent in non-verbal ways, is Otto's feeling sad about something, and Wiki quite out of character comes over and like it's like is she, are you all right and she touched his arm and a tiny electric shock passed between them mm. even though she hadn't asked first it was okay mm. Mm. i just thought that was really nice and a really like strong counterpoint to this like older white man really pressuring them and them not feeling like they can say no to mm. him right at the beginning yeah 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 and a counterpoint as well to you know like this this is a book about boys having adventures it is in for a large part you know it's it's a it's a boys book isn't it mm. and it's about masculinity and it's about kind of and it, it explores that quite widely you know like there's a there's a point where it feels like the two boys are going to have a fight and it's sort of described how they know when a fight's coming on they can feel it yeah. and um and, you know, they brace themselves for it anyway. Like, it's clear that they do sometimes have fist fights. Um, and it's, you know, I think... Um, and that's a part of their relationship. Yeah, yeah. So it do, it does kind of... It doesn't shy away from that. Um, but I guess also, because it, it's their friendship and it's that kind of, I guess, classic difficulties of male friendships, of, like, ego getting in the way is a is a really big thing in this book of kind of like they're so close they're so tight but like they get jealous of each other and they get you know um they want to one up each other and like there's definitely that sort of like f- finding a balance between like friendship and ego and like forgoing your own ego um yeah for the sake of friendship um yeah is kind of like... But their relationship in the end, like, Otto, I'm not going to, like, actually spoil what happens, but Otto has a real, like, come-to-Jesus moment about his feelings of 
jealousy towards Sheed. Mm. And Sheed is out of the story for a little bit. And then he comes back and Otto is just so relieved that he hugs him and cries. Mm. And um, Sheed says, why are you crying? I thought legends didn't do that. And Otto says, I'm amending our yeah. rules. Like yeah, he yeah. said that like crying is a healthy part of being like yeah. a legendary Austin boy. Yeah. That was really nice as well. <laughs> there is quite a lot of crying in this book, actually. There is, yeah. But that, I mean, that's that's the other way. Like Otto as rule keeper, because he's got his. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they've, they've got their manoeuvres, which Otto has written down in a book, and he does his deductions. I think I fell in love with Otto quite early, very early on in this story when he's getting up to get dressed right at the beginning of the day. So Otto has a t-shirt that says, stand back, I'm going to deduce. (laughs) (laughs) Green with big white block letters. (laughs) Yeah. So he's really into his deductions. He's got this kind of Sherlock Holmes thing going on, but like... And the narrative is peppered with like pages from Otto's notebook which is like a really like nice little device. Entry 36, <laughs> we froze time. <laughs> um, entry 35, small things equal easy to move. Medium things equal a little tougher. Teamwork helps. But we couldn't move grandma even when we work together. Why? Deduction, grandma is too big to move. <laughs> Don't call me big boy, grandma said. Sorry. <laughs> Can we talk about the illustrations by Dapo Adiola now? Because I'm just looking at them. This yeah. illustration of, like, Sheed still in bed and Otto, like, <laughs> smilingly opening the curtains and, like, making the light go on his face. The facial expressions in the illustrations are just... Yeah, yeah. I really like them. I like them a lot. Um, yeah. I love how he draws Sheed's hair. So Sheed's hair is a sort of a bit of a point of contention between the boys. She is trying to grow it yeah. out into an afro, and eventually he yeah. wants to have dreadlocks. And like Otto's like, yeah. stupid hair. You know, he's just got it. And you see in the pictures, it's just like cut really short. Um, yeah, and yeah, yeah. She's always got his little pick for picking out his afro, his little comb with him. I mean, they're very, like they're sort of like bubble cartoon drawings, aren't they? Um, in black and white. But it is, it's just, oh, I don't know, I just think it's so clever because it's, it's kind of such simple drawing, but you get so much emotion in it. And the map, the map of Fry at the beginning is really great. Have you looked at that? Ah, uh, I missed this. It's cool, isn't Let's it? Let's have a look here. It's like a hand-drawn map and then oh, on top of the map there's Sheed's comb, there's crayons, there's the, yeah. the camera. Little key to the city there. Yeah. <laughs> Sheed's comb has got like a clenched fist yeah, for the like handle. Yeah, a black power fist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Fantastic. Some great little details in there. So I guess, with, you know, we're talking about the masculinity, the sort of male friendship thing. I, I felt it was worth mentioning in this, not as a criticism, but as an observation. It's very, very heteronormative. Yes. I think, you know, it's worth mentioning this because we've mentioned the opposite. If this was a a story that was particularly or exclusively about gay relationships, it would be worthy of comment. So I think it's also worthy of comment that this is almost entirely kind of any romance in this is boy meets girl. Yes. And is and is kind of that sort of the one perfect girl trope. Mm, Um, And kind of, you know, and done very well, you know, it's the kind of little boys having crushes or in some cases much older boys having crushes and it that kind of like confusion of feelings and sort of just coming out of that age of like eh, girls and uh, girls is yeah. kind of like i think yeah, done quite well it? because the cousins are on different sides of that she's like ooh girls and otto's still like ooh girls <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're not talking to each other about that yet. And no, she's just no. tipping over into the, <laughs> into the other side. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. That's an interesting one. I don't because I, I kind of figured these two were the same age, but she's more mature. Mm. It doesn't actually say how old they are. I would say they're just prepubescent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I, I've read them as the same age, mm. but. I think it would be possible to read Sheed as kind of six months to a year older. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think if they're not the same age, they're very close in age. Yeah. 
but just on that cusp. Yeah, yeah. Because I think the girls in this story are other. I think this is what I mean by it's very much a boys' book, which isn't to say it yeah. like you know the the girls are not cliches. They're not just. I mean, I suppose they are supporting characters, but they're not tropes, you know. And the no, the Ellison not. sisters, they're kind of rivals for being the best legend crime solving duo in town. And it's and it's pretty firmly established that like they are better, right? <laughs> like, and when we meet the girls, like <laughs> Wiki, the de facto leader of those two, is just like rolling her eyes, like, "Oh, here we go again." You thinking that you've got like a patch on me? Um, so like, they're strong female characters, but like very like it's very much written from the boys' point of view. Like the girls are other in that sense. Yes. They're kind of like almost mm-hmm. as alien as the big weird platypus elephant creatures are. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of oh now the time sucks. Time sucks. sucks. Cool. Now we're going to go and have a conversation with the girls. Oh god, what what weird yeah. things will we find out from them? Like. Yeah, and actually Wiki is a lot quicker than Otto. Like, Otto comes to these conclusions by writing into yeah. a notebook. And then he talks to Wiki, and Wiki's already yeah, worked and, it out. and he's so frustrated by that, because it's like, that's not fair. She's, she's, I'm way better than her, because I work at it. She's just gifted. Like, anyone can be gifted, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> I write everything down. Like, I'm, you know, yeah. The building picture of Otto's deep kind of insecurities and um, self-esteem yeah. issues and kind of overcoming that is is really lovely. It's a real heart tug, actually, watching this little lad navigate, um, navigate the realisation that he's not the most important thing in the world. Yeah, that's yeah, difficult for um, is, is It's lovely, actually. It's really, really well worked. Yeah. To, to the point where it kind of, I mean, it feels to me like, you know, it is the two of them, Otto is the protagonist, like, above and beyond yes, it's his yeah, story, I think. <clears throat> and maybe it'll be different in the sequel, maybe we'll spend more yeah, time with Yeah, that would be nice, actually, I'd like that. Yeah. 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 Because it feels like, I mean, the emotional growth, anyway, in this book is inside of Otto. Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. Like he's the one that goes on more yeah, of a yeah. journey. Yeah. Oh, it's dead good. <laughs> it's really great. <laughs> it um, is. It is really good. Um, who is it for? Me. Do you think? <laughs> I try to steer away, and I've always tried to steer away with the recommendations in this, of, like, gendering it. It does feel like this is this really is a book written for, like pre-adolescent boys yes and specifically for pre-adolescent yeah, to- yeah boys. totally I totally think. i think it is a book for girls as well but it's but yeah just having having that having that representation as well as you say like your superhero fans yeah totally totally or like but again sort of as i say with the, like the phantom tool booth link i think similarly to that like it's as much an adult's book as it is a kid's book, like it's totally marketed yeah, for a young definitely. audience. But I, I mean, I had great fun reading this. Like it's clever and it's a really satisfying plot. Like it, like it deals with time travel really well. It's, it. Yeah, it does. It's a really good time travel story. It's just, it's good daft sci-fi and. Yeah. You know, when you were saying that you didn't think that um, Dodie Smith read much sci-fi when she wrote. Yeah. Starlight Barking. Lamar Giles. I think you're absolutely reads right. It reads as like more informed and less like someone going, Oh, maybe I'll give this sci fi thing a go. Like he knows what he's doing, but it's that yeah. similar level of now this is happening, but with more self awareness. Cause it's just got that tongue in cheek thing like like he knows exactly the shortcuts he's taken and why. Um but yeah, so I'd I'd recommend it to adults as well. Um, I think it'd kind of be a great holiday book. Well, it definitely feels really summery, doesn't it? it yeah, feels totally. It like totally. those summers that feel like they'll never end when you're a kid. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. just like tootling around town on your bike. Yeah. And 
you know, just like looking for stuff to do, stuff to get into. Yeah. Well, and the kids at the moment have had what four, or five months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor things. <laughs> Feels weirdly prescient, this, doesn't it? Written last year about the end of summer, <laughs> and then it happened. But four or five months where you're not allowed to touch people or interact with people. Yeah, it's very similar. It's very similar. It's yeah. uh, Lamar Giles is some kind of prophet. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And it's first of a series and it sets up the second book so well. Like I'm definitely mm. I'm definitely keen for um Last Mirror on the Left. It leaves things open for like a whole new story in a really mm. big way. Like I d- this second book is not gonna be pulling the same trick again. No, I think it's about um Mrs. Needraw, the woman with all the mirrors. Oh fantastic. Oh we haven't That's talked about Mrs. Needraw. He runs the Rorim Mirror Emporium. <laughs> <laughs> which is just mirror spelt backwards. <laughs> like this yeah. is I think it's gonna yeah, I think it's something to do with her, yeah. Mm. From mm. what I read in the blurb. So that's out so if you've read this and you can't wait for more, the sequel's out on the twenty eighth of October. Available for pre order now. Fantastic. So, uh, that was episode nine of Even the Trunchbull, and we're back, and it felt like the first day back at school today on this rainy, windy, August, but sort of, you know, autumn gusty day. Yeah, I always forget in August that it's not the height of summer anymore. Autumn always catches me by surprise. I'm like, oh, yeah, September. So, you know, we hope that we captured that back to school feel for you. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah i think we are going to be getting into some nice autumn books aren't we um mm-hmm. including are we allowed to are we allowed to reveal i think we're going to end this series with the moomins which i'm really excited about we're going to do moomin valley in november we've got moomin expert dave pickering coming on to talk about it we do we do we have a special guest um yes moomin expert and also um dave uh does a podcast called Down to a Sunless Sea, which is um, about it, his experience of do, making a documentary about his dad's experience of dementia. Yeah. It's really good. You should all go and listen to it right now. It's not for kids. Not so much, but no. I think most of you are grown-ups, actually. So go and listen to Dave's podcast, Down to a Sunless Sea. We'll link it in the show notes. Should we get back to the script? Sure. <laughs> So that was episode nine of Even the Trunchbull. Thanks for listening. Once again, if you've any thoughts on books you loved as a kid... Or love now as a kid. Let us know, or ask a grown-up to let us know. We're at Even the Trunchbull at gmail.com and on Twitter at TrunchbullPod. Intro music for this episode and every episode is What a Wonderful Day by Shane Ivers. And remember, kids' books can be for everyone, because we've all been kids. Even the Trunchbull. Trunchbull.